I'm just going to hold you better. Right. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Um, so basically what I wanted to do, and I don't know how much time I have, I'm just going to keep going until someone up there starts doing this. Um, Vice, I wanted to quickly explain a little bit about how Vice came to be, the, the kind of powerhouse that it is now. How it went from that tiny little magazine to being bigger than MTV in, in not very long. And I, and I really want to do this from the point of view that I meet so many intelligent emotionally intelligent, spiritually intelligent, good, kind, awesome human beings working in marketing, in startups, at brands, at agencies. And one of the things that I keep finding again and again and again is that all of us are exhausted. Like, I, I know that this is particularly me right now, but like, we are so tired. And I was thinking about it the other day, I started thinking, I don't know who you work for, and honestly, I don't care. I don't care who you work for, right? I just know that you're probably really tired, same as me. And I think the reason, I was watching my little cousin uh, play uh, football the other day, and the ball goes over here, and 22 little five-year-olds like, chase the ball. And then they, they fight, and some of them fall on the floor, and they, they start crying, and then the ball goes over here. And 22-year-old, five-year-olds chase the ball. And I remember, I remember thinking, this is exhausting. And then I thought, this is what we're doing. This is what people in marketing, in brands, in agencies are doing. Because what happens is, something happens, and all of us go, that's the new thing, right? So it's like, virtual reality. <laughs> 360 video. The Facebook carousel, right? And I started remembering all the things that were once very exciting, like when I was growing up, I was convinced everyone would have one of those segways, you know, one of those things you go on like this, and everyone had the mini disc, and, you know, for 11 years now I've worked in innovation, it's every, every single year is supposed to be the year of VR. This is the year of VR. It's never going to be the year of VR, right? Because, not because VR is not very good, but because VR is a trick, it's a gimmick, it's a fad. It's a good thing, it's amazing, it might one day take off, but not because of the technology. And what I wanted to do, just before we even get into this, was show you how I think Vice got the right word in its head and focused on that one word. And that word is the long version for the word internet. Because if I say to you guys, give me a word to do with the internet, and you go, Snapchat, I'm like, good word but it's not the right word, right? If I go, give me a word to do with the internet, mobile. No, nope. that's not the word either. The word that everybody should be obsessed with and get a tattoo on the front of their head of is just networks. And I want to prove this to you. The first time when I started my, ages ago, I basically had a job where I was a digital transformation person for celebrities, which is the most fun and the least fun job in the world. And basically, my first client ever, when they, they uh, I worked for William Morris and Devil, the biggest talent agency, and the first person they said to go and meet, because I was like a young kid with no friends and no girlfriend who was really good at digital, which is usually the way it is if you're very good at digital. <laughs> you don't have many friends. <laughs> so it's nice to be here with people now. Um, and so what they said was, go and meet Madonna. And I sat with Madonna and her team. And, and you could see Madonna and her team, she was like, oh, she was already a bit busy for this. You know, she was like, she had a photo shoot in Vogue. She had a big, like, double page square going in Vogue. And she and her PR person said, can you quickly explain this? Because we've got a photo shoot coming up. And I said, okay, let me try and explain. The internet is short for internetworks. It means that there's lots and lots of little networks where people who are at, can act in ways that they can connect with each other no matter what you're into. And she was like, okay. And I was like, what I'm basically saying is if you're clever about that, the strategic opportunity of that is so huge that you could be bigger than Vogue in about a year's time. I guarantee you, if you do what I tell you, Vogue will be tiny and you'll be 100 million social connections. And she went, okay. And the PR person said, uh, we've got to go now. And they left. <laughs> and where's Madonna now? Right? <laughs> no joke. And I take great pleasure telling you that. Okay? Meanwhile, I went across the road, literally in LA, like about two blocks away, and had exactly the same conversation, explaining it to Lady Gaga. 
And I said, the internet is a set of interlocking networks around people's causes and passions and what they're about. And you can infiltrate this with messaging and activate those networks on your behalf to help you build your brand. And she said, I don't understand it, but I want to do it. <laughs> and she became 180 million social connections across all the social touch points within three years. And Madonna was tweeting at her, you're stealing my brand. Yes, we are. So the reason I'm telling you this is because in any brand, people who are getting market share, if anyone's ever read How Brands Grow, written by a very annoying man who happens to also be very correct, Byron Sharp, right? If you ever meet him, don't go for a drink with him, but he's right. If you're not constantly recruiting new users into your brand, you're shrinking. If you're not constantly recruiting new users into your brand, you're shrinking. Fact. And so what Madonna did was she kept thinking, she believed in the old model, which was hit the mainstream with ads, hit the mainstream with PR, hit the mainstream with the internet, just decimated the mainstream. There isn't the mainstream anymore. You can go home and watch whatever weird shit you want on Netflix. You don't have to watch the 40. I remember when my mum explained to me, my brother, it was going to be a fifth TV channel. And we were like, whoa, five different TV channels, right? Now Netflix spent eight billion this year on content, right? So we don't have attention. And then as we're going to talk about in a minute, we don't have trust. Right, we've got about, I wish we had more time for this. If we had a whole day, I would just do the whole day on this. I swear to God. Do me a favor, because we're never going to get through everything. Email me with what you're passionate about. And I'm going to play a game. I'm going to try and find you a piece of content on Vice. Now it's not just, Hello. It not just what you're passionate about, but also will go as far as you've possibly seen into explaining why you love it. So whatever you're into, and I, had, I asked this in Japan, and I got some very interesting answers. Um, so, and I said, genuinely. So what I'm trying to say with this is, whoever you are on the inside, right? Because we all love our jobs, and we all love the person that we are in the boardroom, but that isn't us, right? Who we really are on the inside is like at two o'clock in the morning when we're having a cigarette, even though we don't smoke, although this is Spain, so you probably all do smoke. But, um, so do me a favor, email me what you're passionate about. I wish, uh, and look, I don't know what you were thinking of, but at some point here, if you talked about food, or technology, music, health, gaming, art, that's what we're doing. We're building um, a media empire based on passion, and then all of those individual things are like Russian dolls. There's multiple tribes within those networks, right? We call them tribes, cultural networks, tribes. I don't even want to go on about this, but this is how we think success works now on the internet. Because you can be a brilliant marketeer, you can be a brilliant creative, you can be a brilliant strategist, you can be a brilliant everything, but if you don't understand the internet, it's going to be a difficult 10 years. And so, all I want to talk to you about today is this one here, Vice Impact, which is a network of people that we realized within our network, there was another Russian doll, which was that actually, across everything we do, we've got a group of people who really give a you-know-what about the planet, which I'm happy to say. So, here it is. This is a $6 billion business plan on a page, but no one ever actually pays any attention to this. It's like, this is, what, this is it. Like, Forget everything you ever learned about the internet. This is it. This is how we do it. And I keep telling everyone, and everyone goes, hmm, good. And then they go back to the same agency that doesn't understand anything about the internet, do the same shit. Because they're all really inspired for the 10 minutes I'm on stage, and they're like, really inspirational. I'm like, was it impactful? Did anything happen? So my challenge to you is, see what you do with this. Strategically activate every network that you wish to recruit users from. If anyone in here said they love food as their first thing, you would put your hand up, and I bet you would have seven or eight people in this, just this room, that, that, that would create the food network within this room, right? And if I wanted to talk to you and I didn't know you, the fastest and best way to get through the problem I have of tension, trust, etc., is to talk to you about food. And then reverse engineer what I'm trying to say into food. And that's the content mindset. That advertising is sitting in the boardroom saying, what do we want to talk about? And then saying, uh, let's just say what we want. And that's not as effective, it's not as sophisticated. So, strategically activating every network we wish to recruit users from, to buy a sharp's point. 
like adding authentic value, I value that is genuine and it's not like, you know, if, if we wanted to talk to the Black Lives Matter network, you know, authentic value would be Nike saying what they say, not Pepsi saying what they say, right? Because Pepsi have no business talking to that. Then, and creating the definitive content in their conversation. So that's it. Anyway, the second meeting I ever had was with Bielo, and it was one of the strangest meetings I've ever had because she sat there smoking a very naughty cigarette for the whole thing. And I said to this is the internet, this is your network thing, and then she said, yeah, so it's like a tree. And I said, yeah, all right, fine. And at the time I thought, it's just Bielo, she's smoking weed. But years later, one of my investors showed me this. And this is Facebook on a particular day in 2011. And this is, I can't get up there, but these pulses on the network, that's what the definitive content activating a network looks like. And those lines that are coming out are lines of share. So literally, I wanted you to see what activating a network on the internet looks like. And let me show you how this all comes together. This is an interesting video, whatever. What's really important about it is you're going to see lots and lots of things that are, are kind of who people are on the inside. Maybe the, the self that they don't show when they're in high society, but the person they actually are when they're brushing their teeth in the morning, right? So let's have a look at this. Right so what are we waiting for exactly? The first guest. No, we don't start just like that. I don't walk out. Are you kidding me? Start right now. Okay. Start. <laughs> Sound by the way, amazing sound. The guys like, yeah. 
Um, look, so the point is, the reason I'm showing you that isn't to be like, hey, look how cool this is. It's just that that's that mentality I was telling you about activating and strategically recruiting from networks in, in practice. I just wanted to show you that we're not just saying that, this is what we're doing. Uh, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Okay. What happened was, we started to realise at a certain point, we were getting older, right? Believe it or not. And we started to realise that we had this massive audience of 300 million young people coming to us all the time. And as is always the North Star of business, we, we, we did the right thing of listening to them most of the time, sometimes not. And when we really started realising what they wanted, we realised that they really did, as I said before, really care. Everyone said young people don't care about what's happening in the world, they care about getting selfies and they don't care about news. We were like, we totally disagree with that. So we started Vice News, as you saw there. And as you saw, we're now the most awarded, Emmy awarded news place on the planet, which is insane. So you've got like news organisations that have been running for 150 years and we've got nine Emmy nominations and they've got two. So the reason we did this was because we wanted to democratise these issues. Because we knew that these things were important, but the news had this distant way of talking about it that young people couldn't connect with. So what we did was we committed to the idea that we would immerse in the most immersive possible way. And one of the first things we made was this, which is the Charlottesville documentary. Please, if you haven't watched this, watch this. And, and, and HBO then did a deal with Vice, and, and now we have Vice News on HBO every single night. So I'm just going to show you a quick example of this. Tonight, a special encore presentation. Vice jumping about the band of Vice News tonight. The Outright is very organized. They love her, she yells. We will clear them from the streets forever. You ain't seen nothing yet. Your body's laying on the ground right now. really tough to top the world's a challenge. We wanted to start doing news, which obviously you can see where this is leading to social causes. We wanted to start doing things in a way where people didn't feel fatigued anymore. So you know how I said at the beginning, we're already tired. Well, the other reason we're already tired is because everybody wants our attention, right? Every charity, every brand with a CSR, kind of boardroom idea, everybody wants our attention and we just don't have enough time to give it to everyone. So all of, all of us are very tired by that. So we thought, how do we refresh these issues? How do we choose issues that we can then keep refresh on and young people will start to care about them? So we basically started to research this and we created Vice Impact. And the whole idea about Vice Impact and what makes it quite unique is that we don't care how many views we get on this content. We don't care. What we care is how much impact, like a little bit like I said earlier, like I don't care how inspirational it is, I care how impactful it is. So what the whole idea is, it's not about view count, it's about actual conversion. It's about donations or numbers of letters written to Congress or numbers of you know people protesting in the street. We literally count the action, not the, the number of views that someone's had. And so far we raised 73 million for charity, uh, for cancer by doing a special report on cancer and the way cancer, and, and by changing the conversation, saying actually, cancer is curable. Like, we are close. And what was interesting was instead of saying, look how sad and how terrible cancer is, because we all have been affected by it, we changed the conversation and said, look how close we are to fixing this. And we 73 million in one week. <clears throat> then we did something about prison systems, where we took Obama, who was at the time the president, Remember the old days. Um, I mean, by the way, in case you're wondering, another reason why Vice is doing very well, because you know that the Oxford English Dictionary Word of the Year was post-truth last year. So people are making amazing work that's really good, and it, but no one trusts it. Even if it's the most perfect, I mean, one of our clients recently just elected an agency, right? And they made this wonderful piece of storytelling, it's amazing, and it's been crucified because it is a documentary style. The reason why we stick to documentary style almost all the time is because it's more trustworthy. It has a higher conversion rate into trust and therefore into shareability. This is something that a lot of people are finding difficult. They're like, why don't we commission this influencer, Kendall Jenner, to do this? Like, no, it's not a good idea. Anyway, so we took Obama into prisons and he basically interviewed inmates about the prison system and stuff. And it started a conversation in America, which up until Donald Trump's election, was moving towards prison reform. And then we did something with uh, Red, which is uh, the AIDS charity, 
where we did a, a big shop of farm with Jimmy Kimmel live and stuff. But anyway, um, I'm probably not going to show this to you because I'm running out of time. And um, it basically talks about how we did Vice Impact. The alarm bells keep ringing. Our citizens keep marching. We have to answer the call. We cannot condemn our children and their children to a future that is beyond their capacity to repair. Young people have a lot at stake. Everything that's going on around us, we care about it, we care about our futures. Part of being an adult is engaging with the world. Hundreds of thousands of people are marching all over the world. There's a revolution going on in the media right now, and you need to be a part of it. How do we get to the next 40 years without destroying the earth? License building, impact channel, leveraging her. You get it, you get it. Anyway, um, I wish I had more time, otherwise I would have shown you the whole thing. Um, do please email me, I, prom I promise to send this presentation. Um, okay, so I'm excited about this. About two years ago, we had to come to a conclusion, which was that as a media company, we weren't innovating with our clients as much as we were innovating with our audience. And this is true of a lot of media companies, right? The model is, Brand wants to reach audience, usually millennials, right? So every brief starts with, we want to reach millennials. Okay, fine, that's great. Yeah, I get it, you know, it's, it's understandable, you know, and that makes sense. But there was, the first thing I'll show you in a second, what we would do is say, okay, that's great, but that's like boiling the ocean, Like right? You're gonna have a lot of ad spend to reach all millennials, right? So we would say, what are the cultural networks that mean the most to you? How do we translate that into understanding those networks and then being part of their conversation? So what we did was we started to take all the theory, all this digital learning, all this understanding that we had, and say, you know what? This is a bit controversial. The agency model, creative agency model, everybody knows. Everybody knows it's fucked. Right? Like everyone knows it's fucked. And because we don't need to make money out of brands, like we get paid 400 million off HBO every year, right? So we don't actually have to make money off brands. So we're like, well, we're probably best place to innovate in. So we said, what if we took this digital knowledge, the funding we have, and the fact that we don't need to make money out of brands, and we can say no, and we can actually educate them and say, guys, look, I could take your money, but honestly, this brief is terrible, right? And you know, that's what I think, you know, that was almost, I think, what was special about advertising in its heyday, right? The best agencies would say to clients, look, you're busy, and I understand why, but this brief is going to lead to a disaster. Okay? And so we, we really felt it was important, important to be able to say no. And so we have said no to a lot of clients. I'm very proud of it. And so what we did was we created virtue. You can see what we did there. And the idea is that we want to do to advertising what Vice has done to media. And we're taking, I'm not going to lie, very similar approach, which is how do we take brands with ideas that they want to get into society and, and they want to recruit into from society, how do we take that network thinking that I told you about and allow you to go and recruit new people into your brand? And so the whole idea is that we have this model for making ideas important. And it's not, not everything we do is necessarily important. Some of it's just stupid and fun. But today I was asked to talk about causes and I thought it was really important to say that brands, and this is my honest opinion, I'm a frustrated human rights lawyer. I don't know why, but I really wanted to be a human rights lawyer until I realized I wasn't smart enough. But, I truly believe that us, these people that I mentioned at the beginning, the smart, emotionally intelligent, but exhausted people that we are, we at brands, at agencies, have the budget, the power, to do the stuff that governments can't even do anymore. Our political system is completely fucked. Everywhere. In, 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 in the UK right now, we, have a, we are literally going to leave Europe. We are literally leaving Europe and nobody wants it. Donald Trump is the president. We are fucked. And if brands don't step up and start to act in their own commercial interests, I might add, because it's not against your commercial interest to act like a good corporate citizen. And I don't mean a CSR team that kind of sits in the corner and does presentations once a year. I mean, make things that are important Put it into those networks that you want to recruit from, and if you're talking to millennials and Gen Z, you will see commercial return. And I want to show you what that model looks like. This is our model. 
So instead of coming and saying millennials, and by the way, every brief we get is going to say millennials or Gen Z, and we know that, right? But what we say is, okay, unless you're literally going to like spend all your money, why don't we target the networks within those conversations that you most want to speak to? So is it young female creatives? Is it uh, first-time mums? Which, by the way, everyone's, no one's really picking the fact that every child born right now is born to a millennial. Like, people are still like, yeah, millennials, it's a little bit of our marketing budget. I'm like, well, you're fucked then. Because you're not recruiting anyone else, and you're not getting the next generation. So, good luck. And so, we, so, so go into that network thinking, cultural tribes, networks, right? Then, immersive empathy. You know, I said to you that when we decided to do news, we decided to immerse deeper than anyone else. And that's a vice thing, we've always done that. So once you know what tribe you're speaking to, try and get really deep. And this is something I tend to find that people on the continent, in France and Spain and Italy, do this really well. People in the UK are very bad at this. We have lower empathy. We're like, oh, what's it like to be that person over there? Don't know. I just know what it's like to be me. Right? <laughs> but use your emotional intelligence. And this is something that, you know, number one, we use a lot of data. We use a lot of uh, tech companies to help us do this. How tightly, I'll give you an example of a network, right? In politics, if you're Republican, the evangelistic Christian network within that consumer base is, it doesn't matter which, this, this shows you how, uh, it doesn't matter if you like or dislike this, it's a very powerful network. It's highly connected with each other. It pretty much follows whoever says to do this. So that's a network, and that's a really strategically important network in American politics, for example, right? But then what are the networks in your brands or in the agencies that you work at? When you get that brief, what does it really mean? When Chanel comes to us and say, we want to improve millennials, we say, yeah, I know, of course, but let's break this down. There's 20 networks here, which ones do you like the most? And then they do their thing, where they, and then they come back and, yeah, young female creators, and we go, good. What's the immersive empathy we can give to them? Well, Me Too's happened, but to be honest, nothing's really changed. Because it kind of went like this, and then it just kind of went away, as, as all inspiration does. And then really the impact wasn't as big as it should have been. So we're back again to a situation where as a young female creative, you're 17% of all art shown in the world is female. So we have a situation where 83% of, is it? 83% of all art hanging on the wall or people on stages or whatever like this, right? And I'm aware of this right now, are men. Just, so like, yeah, me too, oh my god, things gonna change. Well, not really. Right? So when we say to Chanel, go back to them and say, if you're gonna go after young female creators and you immerse you think, what can we do? So then we ask, well, well Chanel, what's in your DNA? What can you do? What could you do that's, that's real without doing a Pepsi situation, right? Where you go, Black Lives Matter is the network. We're gonna send our can of Pepsi into that. That's a disaster, right? So you start asking, this is another vice thing, authenticity. Like, I don't know, I actually want at least 20% of the audience today to not like me. Right? That's genuine, I mean that. Because I would rather the 80% or maybe uh, hopeful 50% were like, yeah, he was really real. That was the most real shit we heard all day. Right? So authenticity. And people say, oh, that's niche. Is it? Or is our media Victorian? Is it from 200 years ago? So you're like, and then this happened. Well, you're never going to connect with young people like that. So Chanel, for example, Coco Chanel, was the first ever female creative entrepreneur. So that's real. That's 100% authentic. You can't shake that. It's not a boardroom claim. It's true. So then, what could we do if we were going after young female creatives and we knew that actually they were really frustrated and then just they, 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 nothing had changed, and that Chanel was the first female creative, and what could we do? So we commissioned this fund. And we convinced Chanel to put a significant amount of money into a fund to commission projects globally about only commissioning young female creatives who were on the tipping point of being big but needed that funding. And the, the, the way back to them, the ROI for them, was that everything was about scent. Just make your project about scent, send it into us. If you can visualize scent, if you can experience the large scent, then we express it to craft for storytelling, which I think can the videos I've shown you show you that's a skill, right, that you have to have. And then of course nobody wants to be the marketing director that ends up with a bit 10 billion views but the brand went bust. So you have to then think about how you create amazing stuff up here, less amazing stuff here, kind of not that great stuff here, and pure advertising here. Because at the end of the day, 
it's not Amelie, it's not that French film Amelie where you give to, you, you, you're like an evil Amelie, right? You give to the network so you can extract more from it, right? But this is the content marketing playbook. But no one wants to really listen. Everybody knows it, because everybody likes to talk about innovation all the time. Everyone's like, come and be an innovation talk, and then everyone goes, great. No one actually goes, that's what we need to do. So I'm just going to show you some work that came out of this. Um, immersive empathy, um, really quickly, this is, we just launched in, uh, in Dubai, so we have a Middle East office. I just want to show you what I mean by Middle East, uh, by uh, immersive empathy. And what I mean by this is, you have to go and you have to really understand the people you're speaking to, like in, who they are on the inside. You have to ask them the 2am questions, you know, the kind of sharing a cigarette questions like, are you happy? What are you afraid of? Like that stuff, not, you know, what passes for insights in boardrooms, a lot of the time it's hilarious, it's like, Millennials love to um, use their phones. It's like, oh God, oh no. And you're never going to get to great work, right? And we have this idea that an, an, an insight should be so powerful it needs to be immortal. I.e., what I mean by that is it needs to be something that anyone would go, yeah, wow, that's true. And see when you're watching this, if the energy in you and the energy in the room changes a little bit as you start to see genuine insights coming through. وفي دلوقتي أو بالأحرى ماضي يتمثل إلي حيوة في حياة ودي أكون لما جوزي وميلة في الميلة من قدراتي وفي الآخر ما تجيبيش أو الأسوأ إنها تروح لحد تبحوش لي زيي فلو تاني مش بحاول أكبر مخافي هو إني أموت والبشرية لسه ما تواصلت مع كائنات فضائية أكثر منها أنا بالنسبة لي أكثر حاجة بخاف منها هي بكرة لأن أنا عارف إن أنا مش بأحسن مكان في الدنيا أكثر شيء بخوفني اليوم هو أرجع للنقطة اللي بدأت فيها كوني حدا طالع من مخيم باللاجئين الفلسطينيين كوني حدا مش دارس وكل يوم عم بكافح لحتى أكبر وأكون أكثر حدا أكثر نجاحا من سابقا هو محفز وشغفي انه اني ما ارجع للنقطه اللي بلشت فيها وهو اكثر اكثر شيء اكثر شيء انا براسي بخاف منه جد خوفي يعني هو الموت الموت منيحه؟ All that. Um, anyway, the point is, uh, before you do anything, you have to know what you're about to do and who you're about to deal with, right? So when we're launching in the Middle East, it's impossible for us not to go to that, and that's four hours long, right? I had to, every single person advised, 7,000 people, has had to watch that in order to understand this. Otherwise, we're going to go in and put our big American foot and go, and fuck it up, just like brands always do. Right? So what brands always do is they go to the network that they want to speak to and they go like your dad dancing at a party, right? It's like, no, you're doing it wrong, right? So I just want to give you an example. Similar because the Chanel one, um, uh, you see a theme here. Um, this was a, uh, this was a, this was a, uh, thing in New York, EDC, it's a big electronic music festival. So in this example, Smonoff came to us and said we want to talk to millennials and Gen Z. Of course, we said, okay, which of these tribes is most important to you when you want to strategically recruit from? They said, hmm, we like that one, electronic music. Seems like a good tribe. Like, we're like, yeah, that's a very powerful tribe. You should definitely speak to that tribe. That's an interesting one. So we started to look into what, you know, immerse into that, what's wrong. I guess what? Same situation. All the guys on stage are men, right? 
So I just wanted to show you how you can take that kind of Chanel thinking and then start to work with it in terms of uh, vodka, for example, right? So we created this, which was Smirnoff Equalizing Music. And we really pushed Smirnoff on this, and Nacho, who, from Diageo, who's actually based here in, 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 in uh, Madrid, was an unbelievable client, because he kept saying to us, we'd come out of the boardroom and he'd be like, push it further, push it further. We'd be like, wow, you're the best client ever. And so what we said was, could it be possible that Smirnoff could go to every single one of the thousand, one thousand festivals that it has globally and say to them, we will not sponsor you next year unless you make the lineups 50-50, male, female, on the Smirnoff stages. This is a big thing to do. This is not really advertising. This is actually thinking like an NGO. This is using your power to connect. And they did it. And it exploded. And before we even got a chance to make the amazing adverts that we wanted to make in the content and the social content, every single newspaper was writing about it. And that network, everyone within electronic music was like, whoa, smart off for doing this. And the next step this year was we launched an algorithm that tells you whether your Spotify is 85% male artists or 15% female artists. And then with a hit of a button, you can recalibrate it to be 50-50. So you can run with these ideas if they're important. One more is, uh, I've got to finish now unfortunately because they're doing this thing now. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates, so this we were very proud of this. Bill and Melinda Gates came, the, the foundation came to us about a year ago and they said, you know, you know, same situation, we're finding it difficult to connect with young people. Um, and we commissioned a whole piece of research and, and essentially came to the conclusion that young people are a bit exhausted with these issues, like they can't hear them get their care, but the way it's being spoken about isn't necessarily connecting. Um, I'm not going to be able to show you much of this video, but just give it two seconds. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. You get that. Um, final one, and I want to show you because I, this is, I truly believe this. It might not be as big as a government or an NGO, but if you're in a brand, you have the potential to genuinely add value to this planet right now. And I swear to God, the youth will thank you for it and choose you over competitors. This is the new distinctiveness. And we went to Dove, so Dove came to us and briefed us, and it was about their Dove men range. And we realized that one of the, going, same thing, right, network, new dads, immersive empathy was, well, you know, men don't take their parental leave because they've got this kind of, I've got to keep working to bring the food home thing, right? That was an impression of me. Um, and so we were like, you know, with the whole fact that, you know, the, the world is slowly, very, very slowly evolving, and men are slowly, even more slowly than everyone else evolving, um, we, we realized that, you know, the, there wasn't enough being said about take your parental leave or even in your company push for more. So some, a lot of companies when you, you know, you get two weeks as a guy, you've got to go back, back to work. There's loads of studies to say that your wife or partner, your child when it's first born needs that contact. Like it's really important for their psychological, spiritual, emotional development. So what we did was we said to Dove Men, okay, we're going to start creating this platform called Future Dads, which is going to be like in a hundred years, Everyone will do this. It will just be given. We'll be like Sweden, right? Um, but for now, we don't. So how do we create this whole platform called Dear Future Dads? And then, this is the, the fun bit, we said to Unilever, we're not doing this unless, like Smirnoff, unless Paul Palmer, the CEO, announces that he's going to extend Unilever leave policy for men from whatever it was to pretty much three times that. And they were like, uh, well, that's going to cost a lot. And we were like, yeah, it is. This isn't some CSR thing. You can't just go straight to making content. And everyone wants to come to Vice because we don't want to make some content. Because they know we make amazing content, as you can see, right? And we go, no, you haven't done anything worthy of content yet. Do something, then we'll make content and it'll be brilliant. But we can't make it amazing unless you do something. So they did. And genuinely, 
Fair play to fair play to them. They extended the parental leave policy. Me being a dad. How's that gonna be? Dear future dads. A happy team and what keep a terrace. Can you do future papa? Children as they're coming into the world, they need that time with both their parents. I remember when she came out, felt like time stopped. And she started looking around. It was exciting and scary. Do whatever you can to take time off. You're never gonna regret it, you're never gonna get it back. There's a lot of great bonding that happens in those first couple of weeks and months. I knew I just had to be there. I had to be there no matter what. First time your kid runs at you from daycare, and I'm like, daddy, daddy, daddy. It's like, I'm a bottle. You are, man. When my daughter tells me I'm her best friend, that's the best part. Best friend. When my kid just walks up to me and hugs me. Okay, anyway. But there's Paul Pullman saying, uh, tweeting about it and actually following through, which I really love. And I think Unilever, to be fair to them, know that what's good for the networks that they want to recruit from is good for business. Let's not get it twisted here. I'm not asking you to be a wonderful human being. I'm, I'm saying, do this for your business. This is how you grow your brand. I'm going to finish now. This is the final thing I want to say. At the beginning, I talked about networks and activating networks. One of the problems about that is it feels niche, right? I know you're thinking, like, that's niche. I just want to hit the mainstream like I used to. And get, well, guess what? The mainstream is gone. The mainstream was a product of the fact you couldn't choose which media you wanted to watch. Now we're all off on our different directions, following our own internal journeys, whatever it is. I'm watching Wild Wild Country on Netflix, learning about yoga and getting into, you know, this is what we're doing. So we are, and, and, and the tribe, and Nike know this, by the way. Nike know that the time for trying to hit everyone and be friends with everyone is over. Over. So what you do now is you choose. We want young, affluent people in big cities, and we don't so much want people that don't believe that all human beings are equal. We don't care. Fair play, because that's good. Even though, yeah, stock price went down a little bit, 37% more like products sold tears. Works. Final thing, this is one minute video. I want to show you that you can activate multiple networks, sometimes in this example, 10 networks in one campaign. Lululemon yoga brand, one of the biggest yoga brands in the world came to us, and they basically said, look, we're flatlining, right? Our, our sales are going kind of not the right way. And we said, okay, we looked at their communications, it's pretty clear why. It's because they were only communicating to the same people in the same way all the time. And think about this if you're in a brand, are you guilty of this? Maybe, right? A lot of brands are. And so what they were doing was they were speaking to like quite rich, affluent, 31 to 45 year old females in like the nice part of each city. You know? So in London it'd be West London, right? But they had never, like Chanel, they'd never strayed out of those places. They're always in these bespoke, you know, kind of luxury environments, right? So we were like, well, that's fine. We're never recruiting new users. We're silly. So in this example, I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to show you 10 different tribes. You're going to see young, uh, you're going to see um, young uh, gay guys in South America. You're going to see hardcore adrenaline junkie girls in California and New York. You're going, to see, um, you're going to see young urban males in London and Paris. So I'll give you an example. Every single one of these tribes, and this is just a wrap-up video that summarizes the whole big platform. Every single one of these tribes, we had to understand them very, very deeply in order to connect with them, right? Because trying to take a yoga brand that's for kind of, you know, like yummy mummies and put it into young, hardcore, like, men in London, isn't that, isn't that easy? What you realize is, when you start breaking it down beyond demographics, you start thinking about cultural networks. You start thinking, okay, so there's a massive cultural network within that tribe. And within young males in France and the UK, hip-hop, and particularly this one type of music called grime, which if you haven't heard it yet, it's coming. It's huge in the UK now. It's like the new hip, it's like, it's basically like hip-hop's, UK's version of hip-hop. Grime and hip-hop don't seem to have much to do with yoga. Right? They're quite far apart. But this is why I still believe, and the gentleman that introduced me, I still believe in strategy. I actually don't believe in innovation. My title says innovation. I hate innovation. Innovation is heartbreaking because you put all your budget into something that's a gimmick, like I was saying at the beginning. Just be strategic. And in this example, we went deep, deep, deep into those networks. And we realized, if you're into hip-hop music, actually, hip-hop is about breathing. If you're a good rapper, 
is because you have incredible discipline on breathing. And guess what else is about breathing? Yoga. Right? So then, and then, you, I wish I had time to take you through how we did this for each of your network. Anyway, Lululemon stock price went up 23%. We became their global agency of record, and we are now. And I'm so proud of this work. I want to show you there's not one yoga mat in this video, and I'm very proud to say. Thank you so much, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much.